The Tom Woods Show, episode 864. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, today's show is brought to you by the good folks at Casper. Get $50 toward any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash woods and using promo code woods. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. I still have this crazy cough, and they're just telling me there's nothing you can do about it. you got to just wait this out. And cough medicine ain't doing nothing for it. So it's been hard to do. Like yesterday's episode, short episode on Trump, I had to just keep coughing through the whole thing. We had to edit them all out. So I'm going to try to rest my voice for another day. And it helps that I've done eight zillion things in the past, uh, recorded many things, created a lot of videos. So I'm going to take something, give you another free sample from the government course I created for the Ron Paul homeschool curriculum. And this particular lesson is on the public goods argument. And in what follows, I'll define what public goods are. You're probably familiar with the argument. This is why we need the government to provide certain goods and services because the private sector can't provide them for these following reasons, and these are all things that constitute public goods. That is a very, very common argument, and we've addressed it at least a couple of times on the show in the past, so I'll try and link to those previous episodes on the show notes page. Uh, this is um, reasonably systematic treatment of the question, and I hope you like it. I hope you find it interesting. If you do, at the end of the of the episode here, I'll tell you how you can get that whole course if, if you like, because there are 90 lessons in that course. I'll give you three different ways to get it. I'll put the ways to get it also on the show notes page, which is tomwoods.com slash 864. And here we go. Hi, everybody. It's Tom Woods. And today we're going to discuss a category of goods that is referred to by many economists as public goods. And it is the existence of public goods that is used so often to justify government and government intervention. So it's important for us to examine public goods, look at the definition and characteristics of public goods, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at public goods theory and analyze it. So let's begin by defining our terms here. The term public goods refers to a set of goods that have the following two characteristics you can see up here on the slide. The first one is jointness in consumption. And so I've written, once produced, that is, once a public good is produced, it can be consumed by an additional consumer at no additional cost. So the reading I'm assigning you for this lesson gives the example of a fireworks display. If there are 500 people attending a fireworks display and I show up and I'm the 501st person, my enjoyment of the fireworks display doesn't add to the cost of the fireworks display. It's the same cost whether five people or 500 people show up. So you can add me to the audience. Let's assume it's a huge field somewhere. You can add me to the audience and it's really costless to anybody for one more person to show up and consume the services. The second characteristic is non-excludability. A public good is one that consumers cannot be excluded from consuming once it has been produced. So people would give, uh, well, again, we could use the example of the fireworks display here. We could imagine it as being something that I could watch from my window. I could watch it from my deck, the deck of my house. There's no way to exclude me from it once it is being provided. And because of that, it becomes hard to charge people for it. In the economy, we charge people for things that if they didn't pay for them, they wouldn't be able to get. So you have to buy paint at the store, otherwise you don't get the paint. Or you have to buy a car at the car dealership, otherwise you don't get the car. But a fireworks display, whether or not you pay for it, you can still get it. Sure, maybe you don't get to sit on the nice field, but you could, you know, a mile away, you could be watching it, or half a mile away from your house. And so it's non-excludable. You can't exclude me from consuming it. A lot of people will give a lighthouse as an example. A lighthouse gives off light 
to help ships avoid shipwreck. So there's some big rock that's jutting out somewhere that's hard to see in the dark. The lighthouse helps them to avoid it. But once the light is cast onto the water, the argument is that there's no way to exclude a non-paying ship. Well, you didn't pay the lighthouse fee, so we're not going to shine our light so you can see it. Once we've shined it, everybody can see it. There's no way to exclude ships from the services of a lighthouse. And so this yields us what's called the free rider problem. So that is to say, if I know I can get some service without having to pay for it, I can get the services of a lighthouse, or I can get a fireworks display, or whatever type of example you can think of, if I can get that without paying for it, I won't pay for it. So the incentive, therefore, will be for most people not to pay for it. And if most people are not going to pay for it, it's not going to be produced. Or it's going to be produced in far less quantity than it would be produced if people were required to pay for it, and therefore a private entrepreneur could earn money providing it. So I have here on the slide a few of the sort of classic examples of public goods. Uh, highways are given as an example that they're non-excludable. It's, it's hard to get to prevent people from getting on the highway. You could have tolls everywhere, but this would disrupt the free flow of the highway and sort of defeat the purpose of the highway. So it's hard to exclude people for not paying for highways. So therefore, you have the non-excludability. And jointness in consumption, the argument there is that one additional person being on the highway doesn't add appreciably to the cost. Uh, then we have national defense here. You can see on the left part of the slide, it's considered to be another example that once national defense is being provided, well, it's easy for people to free ride on that because if other people are paying for the defense, that means I don't have to pay for it. And the defense is going to defend me too. If I live right next door to people who have paid for national defense and I haven't, well, if they're going to get defended and I live three inches away from them, I'm going to get defended too. So I can free ride on that. So we say that that's a public good. I already gave you the example of lighthouses on the previous slide. So these are considered to be examples of, of public goods. Now, the, whether they really are examples of public goods is another matter. Uh, all these services have at one time or another been provided uh, by the private sector. They have been provided by voluntary contributions rather than through taxes. Now, the interventionist claim, that is the claim that's made by people who favor government involvement in the economy and in life in general, is that goods that have the characteristics of public goods will be underproduced or not produced by the private sector. They say that it will be, they'll be inefficiently provided. They'll say that the temptation to free ride on these goods will mean most people would just be inclined to free ride and not contribute anything. And so therefore it becomes hard for a businessman to earn profits providing this good. So he's either not going to provide it or far fewer businessmen will provide it than before. You have that. And then also if it's a good that at zero cost, an additional person can consume it. Well, if that's costless to everybody, why not just let additional people consume? So the private sector again will underproduce instead of saying, hey, what a wonderful type of good this is. Everybody can enjoy it costlessly once we've decided to provide it, so let's just open it up for everybody. Well, no one's going to do that, so we need the government to provide these goods. That is the, that's the conclusion that they jump to, that these things will be underprovided, therefore government ought to provide them. Now, we need to stop and consider what some responses to this government argument might be, because in your traditional government course, there would be no responses. It would be assumed that all sensible, right-thinking people agree with this analysis, so we don't even need to stop and consider alternatives. But again, we're trying to be a little bit more open-minded than that here, so I want to offer you some of the arguments that a non-interventionist might make, somebody who does not favor government intervention into the economy and into private life. So, for example, up here on the slide, if it's claimed that the free market, the private sector, the people who are seeking profit will not allocate resources efficiently. They won't supply public goods in the quantities that people want them in. Well, can't government also have the same failure? How would government know in what quantities people want these things? I mean, you could send around a questionnaire, but that's ridiculous and pointless. People can write anything on a questionnaire. Sure, I'd love to, I'd love for the government to take uh, 800 trips to the moon every year, but 
if their money isn't on the line at the moment that they're filling out that questionnaire, it's totally meaningless. The only feedback mechanism that's valuable from consumers is what money are they willing to pay at this second for this particular service? And there's no way we can get that information. So the government will also, of necessity, be providing goods inefficiently. So if we're going to claim, which I don't, by the way, but if we're going to claim that the private sector will provide these goods inefficiently at an inefficient level, so will government. There's no reason to think that government would be any better at determining what is the correct array of goods that need to be produced to optimally satisfy consumer preferences. Then secondly, up here on the slide, why assume that the free rider attitude is the only attitude? This seems rather reductionist to assume that people act on the basis of one attitude. And, and that attitude being that if I don't have to pay for something, I won't pay for it and I will just be a parasite enjoying the labor of others and not contributing. Well, some people may act that way, but why would you assume everybody would? Like, that, that seems entirely unwarranted. Some people may, might contribute to something that they don't have to contribute to, but they might contribute to something out of just general civic pride or they want to support their local community and they want to be part of it. I mean, this is why people contribute to charitable causes. Nobody thinks my $5 is going to be the $5 that cures cancer, but people contribute anyway because they want to. They could free ride entirely on scientific research, and yet, by and large, people don't do that. And they would do even less of that if they had more money it weren't all being taxed away from them. So there's that point. And then also you can think of other rationales like Christian charity, for example, that might explain why somebody would voluntarily contribute to something instead of just being uh, an antisocial free rider. Then the last item on this slide, the free rider objection is actually useless because it applies to everything. In effect, everybody's a free rider on pretty much everything that exists. Uh, the great economist Murray Rothbard put it this way. And, and before we read this passage, let me explain to you. We'll talk later in the course about capital goods. Capital goods are goods that we use to create consumer goods. They're the machines and equipment that's used to produce toothbrushes and uh, mops and magazines and books and frisbees and whatever. It's the machinery, it's the inputs that go into producing those things. And it's because we have capital goods that we can produce so much stuff. If we didn't have these capital goods, we'd have to produce everything by hand, which means we'd be producing a heck of a lot less stuff than we produce now. And there'd be whole categories of goods we couldn't produce at all if we didn't have capital goods. We couldn't produce a plasma TV with your bare hands. So it's because we have this inheritance of capital goods provided to us by businessmen and by businessmen who came a generation ago or a generation before them. We have this great stock of capital goods thanks to them. So Rothbard says, the great modern accumulation of capital goods is an inheritance from all the net savings of our ancestors. So our ancestors saved up so that they could spend money buying this great equipment that makes it possible for us to produce so much more stuff and to live so much more abundantly and to be able to get things so much more cheaply. And so Rothbard says, without them, we would be living in a primitive jungle. We are all, therefore, free riders on the past. So we're all free riding on the most important aspect of the whole economy, which is our productive structure. I didn't contribute anything to that. So the free rider analysis, given that it applies to everything, it's not really clear that it would really be all that useful or enlightening. Also, the distinction between public goods that have the characteristics we looked at on the first slide and private goods seems flimsy. So we're told, we've been told over the years, for example, that railroads are public goods, streets are public goods, telephone services are public goods, the postal service is a public good. But yet, those things all seem to be excludable. It seems to be that I could exclude somebody from a railroad if he didn't pay. I could exclude somebody from being, uh, making a telephone call or mailing a letter. I could limit those things to people who pay for them. So what makes them public goods? Uh, even national defense or security, that's not a public good when you think in terms of, think about anything you could take out insurance on. I take out an insurance policy on my house against a, a terrorist attack or whatever. 
the point is that, yeah, even if you say that national defense is a public good and people will free ride on it, well, what they can't free ride on is an insurance company that will reimburse them when their house is destroyed. If you didn't pay for the policy, you're not getting the reimbursement. So you can't free ride on that, and that's what really matters, isn't it? Can you actually get your stuff back, and can you get your house rebuilt after you've been attacked? Well, you take out insurance against that, and insurance is a private good. And so that solves the apparent public good uh, issue of defense and security. Then conversely, many private goods seem to have the characteristics of public goods. So a rose garden, for example, an additional person can enjoy looking at a rose garden costlessly. It's very difficult to exclude people from looking at my rose garden if they're passing by on the street. So why don't we say rose gardens, therefore, will be underproduced, so the government needs to produce rose gardens. Maybe, maybe, maybe the government should reimburse me a portion of the expense for my rose garden. Or street musicians. We all walk by street musicians. We don't all put a dollar in the cup. But everybody enjoys the street musician equally in the sense that nobody can be excluded because everybody has ears whether or not you put a dollar in or not, and yet street musicians still do continue. And one additional person can enjoy a street musician without any additional cost. So these are that would seem like a public good. Why doesn't the government provide uh, street musicians then? Why don't they tax us and redistribute the money to street musicians? Because after all, street musicians will be underproduced because they have the characteristics of public goods. Uh, they'll be underproduced according to some arbitrary level that, that these economists think they should be produced at. Or what about, this is Hans Hoppe's example, what about my use of deodorant? My use of deodorant makes me smell a lot better to people around me, but they didn't contribute to that. They're all, they're all getting the benefits of my nice smell, but they can free ride on that. So therefore, maybe my wearing deodorant is a public good. Maybe the government should subsidize deodorant because other people get the enjoyment without having to pay. I can't exclude them from the enjoyment of my deodorant. So there's a public good aspect to my deodorant. So therefore, government should subsidize my deodorant. Or what about all the wonderful personal qualities I have? that I have acquired over the years by training myself to be a good person or to be charming or reading books on etiquette. I've made myself a wonderful person and everybody who comes in contact with me gets to see how wonderful I am, gets to enjoy my wonderfulness. Wonderfulness is a, is a word I'm, I'm taking from Bill Cosby who had a comedy album called Wonderfulness that I enjoyed when I was a kid. But the point is there again, people can free ride. You people who enjoy my goodness when you get to meet me, you didn't contribute to that. You didn't buy me the etiquette books. You didn't uh, force me to train myself to be nice and polite as, as opposed to rude. And yet you enjoy the benefits. So you're going to free ride. So my good qualities are being underproduced. So therefore, the government should subsidize or create etiquette classes to train us all to be good people because other people can enjoy our goodness without contributing to it. It's not excludable. So you see, the theory doesn't really work that well. Because the distinction between public and private goods really doesn't seem to work. Gang, we will rejoin this subversive talk in just a moment after we keep the lights on by thanking our sponsor. Folks, imagine this. You create a product and it gets over 20,000 reviews with an average of 4.8 stars. Would you think you were onto something? Well, that's what the Casper mattress people have managed to do. And a mattress is something you spend one third of your life on. So you're going to want to get this right. And you're thinking, Woods, I can't order a mattress online. Of course you can. They send it to you in this box where you say, how do they fit this mattress in this box? And they give you 100 nights risk-free in your home. If you don't love it, they'll come pick it up and refund you everything. The Casper is an obsessively engineered mattress at an excellent price. It combines supportive memory foams to create an award-winning sleep surface with just the right sink and just the right bounce. Free shipping and returns to the U.S. and Canada. You're running out of excuses here. Designed, developed, and assembled in the USA. And we're giving you $50 toward any mattress purchase when you visit Casper.com. That's C-A-S-P-E-R. Casper.com slash Woods. And you use promo code Woods. Also, economics is supposed to be a vertify science, which means a value-free science. Economics is supposed to tell you how the world works. It's not supposed to tell you what to do. 
You know, you consult uh, an ethicist for that. You consult moral philosophy for that. You consult your priest, your minister, your anybody you look to for moral guidance. But you don't, for heaven's sake, you don't consult an economist. That's not what economics is. Economics is just a simple description of the world. But yet in pu- the public goods theory, economists are sneaking in a moral norm, which they're not supposed to do because that's a different, that's a different area of study from economics. So they're saying public goods will be – are goods that will be underproduced by the free market, by voluntary people buying and selling. Maybe that's so. You have to analyze it, see if their theory is correct. Uh, I don't think it is, but, but you can look at it and see if they're right or wrong. But then they jump from that to therefore the government needs to provide them. Well, now hold on a minute. Well, that's, they're smuggling in a moral norm there. Just because something isn't provided at a level that economists think it should be provided at, you can't jump to the conclusion that therefore they ought to be provided. If people really want them, they'll figure out ways to get them. But just to say they therefore they must be provided, that's a moral norm. That's not, that's not what economics is supposed to be. Now, what would the moral norm really be? If they spelled out, because if they're going to say things like this, that, well, there's this special category of goods and it won't be produced in the right quantity, so therefore people should be forced to contribute to it, they darn well better have a fully developed moral philosophy to justify this brief jaunt into morality uh, that they're making, that they, these things must be provided. It's morally necessary to provide them. We must do this. And yet you look through the economics text, there's no attempt to justify that statement morally. Well, no wonder, because think about what that statement would amount to if economists ever bothered to state it bluntly. And here's how Hans Hoppe puts it. He says, here's what their norm would sound like. No wonder they don't want to state it outright. Whenever it can somehow be proven that the production of a particular good or service has a positive effect on someone, but would not be produced at all, or would not be produced in a definite quantity unless others participated in its financing, then the use of aggressive violence against these persons is allowed, either directly or indirectly with the help of the state, and these persons may be forced to share in the necessary financial burden. Well, if that were my norm, I don't think I'd want to state it either. Also, how can we know for sure that people prefer the public goods over whatever other good they might have purchased with the money that's been taken from them to spend on the public goods. Of course, there is no way to know that. The only way we can know that people are better off than they were before is when they voluntarily spend their money and somebody voluntarily gives them something back in exchange. If I buy a newspaper from you with my dollar, that means I preferred the newspaper to the dollar and you preferred the dollar to the newspaper, so we're both better off. The fact that we both enter into the transaction indicates that we both expect to be made better off by the transaction. But if I'm the newspaper man and I just take your dollar and give you a newspaper, well, I'm better off. I took your dollar. But who says you're better off? If you didn't voluntarily buy the newspaper, maybe you're worse off. Maybe you only value that newspaper at 50 cents. So when an exchange is forced, there's no way to say people are better off. Because probably the person who's having something taken from him is worse off, and certainly you can't prove that he's better off. So there's that problem that is resting on this whole issue as well. And then, remember, public goods are going to be provided through tax money. The tax money will pay for all these uh, goods that supposedly free individuals couldn't provide. But the tax system imposes deadweight losses on the economy. We'll talk about this when we get to our one of our lessons on the welfare state. That taxes, for example, make people tend to want to work less because the reward for working is less, so people will tend to do less, and so therefore less will be produced in the economy, so prices will tend to be higher. So that puts a drain on the economy. The drain that's involved in collecting taxes, the forms people have to fill out, the time they have to spend on it, the workers in the tax bureaucracy who are spending time taking money from people instead of doing something productive with their lives. This is all a waste for society. So this is a burden on, on society. So if you're going to say the free market is inefficient because it doesn't produce public goods to the extent that I think it should, 
Well, we can say the government is inefficient because it's funded in a way that is grotesquely inefficient and, and imposes all kinds of losses on the economy. So you'd have to – if you're going to claim the free market is inefficient, you'd have to weigh that inefficiency against other inefficiencies, among them the inefficiencies produced by tax financing of public goods. Then we have the fact that microcomputer software is a clear counterexample to all this. Microcomputer software has public good characteristics. Once you write the software, once you program it, it's available to be copied pretty much costlessly by additional users. And it's very costly to prevent this, to prevent this copying. And so it's, a, it's essentially non-excludable. Anybody can get it once it's been produced. And yet, Bill Gates became one of the world's wealthiest men by providing this supposedly public good and public goods supposedly can't be produced at a profit in the private sector, which is why the government needs to produce them. And yet, here we have a good with public good characteristics being produced in the market. Or radio broadcasts. These are supposedly public goods. There's no way to exclude people from the broadcast. An additional person can be listening in without adding any cost to it. But we have the cases of Britain and Cuba where the government produces radio broadcasts, and yet... A black market that is an illegal market exists for private, non-government radio broadcasts. And so this shows that private, non-government provision of so-called public goods can thrive even when subsidized, that is, government-funded or, or government-assisted public provision is already taking place. All right, now let's move into an analysis of public goods theory itself. What purpose does it serve? It's, it's shot through with problems and fallacies. So why does it exist? What purpose does it serve? And here I want to introduce you to the work of Professor Randall Holcomb, who at the time of this recording is a professor at Florida State University, I think. I'm mean, pretty sure it's Florida State. And this is very cynical stuff. And I'm inclined to accept it, but I'm just warning you that he doesn't assume that our government officials are wonderful people who are just dispassionately pursuing the common good. Uh, he doesn't assume that. He assumes that they're regular people like the rest of us. Uh, they may be somewhat more grasping than the rest of us, but he doesn't assume that they're angelic. And he tries to explain their behavior without assuming that they're angelic, without assuming that they are a special race of mankind. No. So here's the what we might, the uh, the syllogism that he begins his his paper a theory of the theory of public goods with. He says people are more likely to act in their own interests than in the general public's interests. Government officials are people. Therefore, government officials are more likely to act in their own interests than in the general public's interest. This is so he's suggesting this is not by any means an unreasonable starting point. He says, now, governments have incentives to, for example, constrain their taxing power. A government can levy whatever tax it wants to. But if it taxes you 99%, you might think, oh, they'll earn a lot of money then. But they wouldn't because would you even bother working if the government is going to take $99 out of every 100 you earn? You'd be an idiot to work under those conditions, so you wouldn't do it. Maybe you would work secretly on the black market or something, but you're certainly not going to work out in the open and let the government take 99% of your income. The government knows this. They realize they would be worse off if they taxed you 99%. But even if they were taxed you 75%, they might be worse off because you would, again, maybe still be less likely to work. So they're going to tax you at a level where they get they get you to keep on working. They want you to work. Because you are their source of income, and you're a person, but you're their source of income, first and foremost. So they're not going to want to tax you ridiculously. They're going to want to restrain their taxing power so that, yes, you may still feel like you're paying more in taxes than you'd like, but at least you're, you're willing to work. In the same way, the governments have an incentive to encourage democracy. Now, this may seem strange. Governments have an incentive to encourage democracy? No, no, no. Democracy is the way the public limits government. But that's, that's sort of a naive view. So what Holcomb is going to say here is that democracy goes a long, long way toward encouraging the idea of the government as legitimate. 
Because, hey, after all, we're the government, right? We vote for the people in government, so the government really is us. And so we're encouraged to sort of accept this kind of juvenile way of thinking that we really are the government. And we would never, no one would ever accept that way of thinking if there was an outright dictatorship in charge. If dictator so-and-so said to you, you all are the government, we'd all know he was an idiot, he's just trying to pull one on us, right? But in a democracy, people will say, oh, well, you know, we really are the government because we all come together to vote and all that. So democracy takes all the energies that people might have, have built up toward overthrowing the government when they're upset and channels them into the more peaceful channel of elections. Well, I'll run for office and I'll show them. And so democracies then, governments in democracies, can conserve resources that they would otherwise have to spend on preventing violent overthrow of the government because the democracy encourages the idea of, of the legitimacy of the government. It encourages the idea that basically we all are the government, that if you're really upset, no, 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 don't try to change things directly. Run for office. And so this makes it a lot easier for, for government to, to go on without any real changes, without having to worry about any real changes being made. And just think about it. You yourself, would you rather be the president in a country with democratic elections? Or would you rather be a dictator who hangs on to power just based on, on fear and threats of violence against the public? On the national defense front, Holcomb is not convinced that, well, government provides national defense because it's a public good and it'll be underprovided on the free market. No, 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 no. People will tend to pursue their own self-interest. Government officials are people. Therefore, government officials will tend to pursue their own self-interest. So Holcomb suggests that, by and large, national defense is provided because the government benefits from it. It's in their self-interest to provide it because it protects their source of income, namely you. And this also helps to explain why the government winds up getting involved in wars in which the people don't seem to be threatened in any way by what's going on in the world, and yet the government still gets involved, well, often because they're protecting some other source of income somewhere else in the world. Another benefit of this explanation is that it doesn't rely on assuming that the reason we have national defense provided is that we just have wonderful public-spirited individuals in government whose public-spiritedness just overflows so much that it makes them want to provide all these services. It means we don't have to think of government officials as being angels or all-wise. We can see more mundane reasons that they might want to provide some of these services. Now, governments are going to have an incentive like anything else uh, like anybody else, will have an incentive to get things they need at the lowest cost. So they're going to want to protect their income at the lowest cost. The income they get, by and large, is tax money paid by you. They have other sources of income, but that's, by and large, it. Now, they could get their income by brute force, just forcing everybody. You've got to contribute. But it's better and cheaper to get the people to want to comply with the government's demands voluntarily. And they do that by persuading the citizens that the government is legitimate. How do they persuade citizens that the government and its behavior and its expropriations and all this other stuff that it does, how, do they, how does the government persuade people that that's legitimate? Through the government-provided education. The government-provided education reinforces the legitimacy of the government. It reinforces conventional patterns of thought. This is what's going to be taught in these institutions. Directly controlling the media would be too obvious. People would see right through this. You have to be more subtle about it. And they do this by means of the education system. So here's how Holcomb explains it. He says, the education system provides an incentive for the student to retain the information approved of by the system. Successful students are those who are best able to arrive at institutionally approved answers. The challenge to the state is to make institutionally approved answers state approved answers, and the best way to accomplish this is to take over educational institutions and make them state-run enterprises. By nationalizing the education industry and making teachers state employees, 
Teachers naturally have the incentive to side in favor of the state whenever there is a question. Teachers become, become tools of state propaganda and often explicitly so. The tenure system, whereby you basically can't be fired after a certain number of years, you can never be fired. The tenure system is an integral part of the nationalization of education. Without tenure, teachers could lose their jobs and end up back in the private sector. Thus, teachers would have more of an incentive to examine the relative merits of the public versus private sectors. Tenure guarantees teachers a government job for life, reinforcing their pro-government sentiments. Support of tenure as a method of preserving academic freedom may have some merit for college professors, but this does not explain why librarians receive tenure or why elementary school teachers receive tenure. Indeed, while tenure is the norm in both public and private universities, in elementary and secondary education, the norm is that public school teachers have tenure while private school teachers do not. Teachers with guaranteed lifetime government jobs are more likely to be sympathetic to government propaganda and thus help reinforce ideas about the legitimacy of government action. So what Holcomb is saying, obviously then, is that the reason the government wants to be involved in education is first to spread conventional state-approved ideas among the students, and then secondly to make sure that they, uh, they get a slate of teachers who will be by and large sympathetic to them because these these teachers are going to have basically government jobs guaranteed government jobs for life well you know you don't bite the hand that feeds you this is going to make them tend to be sympathetic to the government and government approaches to various problems and so this is a way therefore that the government can promote the idea of its own legitimacy by in encouraging a slate of teachers who will promote that idea in the heads of the students and yet they don't have to force anybody to do anything. People's own incentives to to uh, defend the institution that employs them, for example, uh, with a lifetime job, uh, they'll do the, the work for them. They'll, they'll, they will, by and large, tend to spread state propaganda as indeed happens in pretty much every government-run school. Now, how about academic research? The, the state could force scholars to publish papers and books that favor the government, but this would undermine the perceived legitimacy of the research. Everyone would be able to see that. Well, we can't trust this paper or this book. The government forced him to write those things. And again, forcing people to do things is expensive. Much better for researchers to voluntarily want to promote the government's legitimacy. Now, traditionally, education is identified as a public good because supposedly there are spillover effects of education. If people are educated, I benefit. I benefit from an educated public in various ways. But yeah, I don't have to pay for it unless the government forces me to. So people can go off and be educated, and I get the benefit of that. I get more and better products. I get more and better books to read by smart people and all that. And I don't pay for that. Uh, I don't pay for their education. So therefore, education will be underproduced because we're all going to free ride on it, so it's a public good. Well, Holcomb does not accept that this is the explanation why government provides education because it's just, it's just providing a public good that will be underproduced on the free market. This is simply not true. He says, if that were the case, then government w there's no reason government has to provide the education. Government could just pay for the education. If the, if the point is that the free market won't provide the money for education services and we'll spend our money on too many frivolous things, then all the government has to do is collect taxes and spend it on privately run schools. Why does the government have to run most of the schools, right? I mean, obviously there's something fishy here. For example, when the government wants to provide low-cost food to people, it doesn't open up its own grocery stores. It taxes people and gives poor people the money. It doesn't have a government-run grocery store. Why does it have government-run schools then? And Holcomb says it's not because they're just trying to provide us a service. It's providing them a service in ensuring that certain patterns of thought are encouraged in the minds of the students. So here is Holcomb's theory of the theory of public goods. Given that the theory is full of fallacies, how do we account for it? He says, public goods theory derives from scholars working within the state-subsidized higher education system. 
this theory, public goods theory, justifies the government production of a lot of goods and justifies the government's existence by claiming that the citizens benefit from the things that it provides. People who believe this theory are more likely to take a positive view of government activity and view the government as legitimate. So therefore, public goods theory furthers the government's interests and thereby the interests of the educators who depend upon the government. Whoa, that is quite a claim by Professor Holcomb, but I thought you should be familiar with it, you should confront challenging ideas, and next time we'll talk about how it is that in the old days everybody earned like five cents a day, and today people earn much, much, much more, and this has nothing, nothing to do with the government at all. So that's next. Thanks for listening. All right, that is that. But before we go, a few things to tell you. First, of course, you may say to yourself, i got to have this whole course. This is unbelievable. Well, you can get it three ways. You can get the course a la carte over at TomWoodsHomeschool.com. You can get it as part of the Ron Paul curriculum at RonPaulHomeschool.com. And you can also get it as a free bonus when you become a master member of LibertyClassroom.com. So those are three ways to grab this course right here. Now, let me tell you about, I'm telling you, you're going to find this interesting. This is a brand new website, again, created by one of my listeners. And this one is called OfficersFarewell.com. And what it's about is the practical side of getting out of the military. A lot of my guests have talked about why you might want to get out of the military, but without covering a lot of the nitty-gritty of the how. I've done a couple episodes dealing with that, but here's a nice website that brings together the practical considerations involved. The creator of the site says that the site is geared toward naval officers, but anyone in the U.S. military will find it applicable. So officersfarewell.com will be the listener website mentioned. He also created, uh, he also has a completely unrelated site called mensjewelrybox.net, and that is a shop he set up for selling jewelry boxes. So mensjewelrybox.net and officersfarewell.com. Check those out at tomwoods.com slash 864. Remember, of course, if you get your web hosting through my special link, then you get all kinds of free bonuses, including this nice mention here and membership in my private bloggers group and lots of other bonuses too, including, by the way, the best price Bluehost makes available to anybody because I'm a VIP affiliate of theirs, so my people get the lowest price around. So it's pretty darn good. Figure out how to do all that and get all those bonuses at tomwoods.com slash publicity. All right, that's it for today. See you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.